invite you to open up the Gospel of Luke in the seventh chapter. We're going to be looking at a familiar text. I'm hoping you uh, might be familiar with it. We're going to be focusing in on the idea of significance and finding significance today and uh, looking at a story that uh, many of us are, are familiar with in, uh, in the story of Jesus being met by a, a woman in a, in, a, in, a, in a Pharisee's house. This has been a tough season for ladies. We have been in the midst of the Me Too movement for the last several several weeks and months, and as you think about the Me Too movement, you have seen it take place in our Hollywood community first, you have seen it take place in our political arena, and you have seen it unfortunately take place in our spiritual environments, in our churches, and in some relatively significant names in our community as women who probably not just for the last couple of months or maybe even the last couple of years have been going through some unwanted um, attention by, by men. And as we look at this and we think about the Me Too movement, some of you might have some stories that you could share that would break our hearts and would make us sad just because of the, the reality of life. And our hearts go out to you at this, at this time. This past week, or the past couple of weeks, rather, my former seminary, the seminary that I graduated from, received my master's degree from, our seminary president has been under some fire for some very dumb, dumb things that he said in the past, and it just makes you wince when you hear some of the thoughts and some of the ideas and some of the things that have taken place and things that have been said, and you just kind of scratch your head and say, what in the world were they thinking? Why were they saying such things? I don't know if you have been paying attention to other parts of the news, but I read something on the New York Times in the, about 10 days ago that was even more heartrending than the Me Too, more heartrending than dumb things that preachers and clergy have done. In the nation of India, in the nation of China, we're coming across a situation that is, has some very strong geopolitical situations and ramifications for not just those two nations, but our nation and surrounding nations. Because they have been practicing gender-selective abortion in India and China, the number of girls in those two nations have drastically plummeted. The biological order of life is that there's supposed to be more girls than boys. They're just, that's just the way life is supposed to be. But in both India and China, because of the cultural traditions are that you value little boys more than you value little girls, and because of the ease of understanding a person's gender while mama is carrying them, they've been aborting the little girls to the tune of over 70 million little girls. And you see this now, and our government is thinking about what is that going to do for a host of geopolitical issues in terms of literally entire villages and schools that do not have little girls and what that's doing to the cultural milieu of those nations. It's kind of fascinating. When we look at the story today in Luke chapter 7, we're looking at Jesus' encounter with the woman, and we've got to understand that in the culture that Jesus lived in that first century world, it was not a friendly culture to women. It was not a friendly culture for ladies at all. In fact, in that day, women could not even go in the Jewish tradition to synagogue for worship. That was related just for men. In the temple in Jerusalem, the women could go in part way, but they could not. They could not fully invest. Their faith was limited to almost a spectator sport. That's just the way it was. In that day, a man was not supposed to talk to a woman that he was not related to. He just wasn't supposed to engage or have a conversation and engage in any kind of relation at all. In fact, there were some parts of that tradition that believed that a woman even picking up the scripture would defile it. And that was something that they were not supposed to do at all. And so when we see Jesus coming on the scene and Jesus coming and doing the things that Jesus did, where Jesus spoke to women in public, where Jesus had taught women as disciples, where Jesus allowed women to follow him as they were growing in their faith journey, where Jesus allowed women to support his ministry financially in other ways, Jesus was doing something extraordinary, extraordinarily radical to women in the first century world. And we see this story of Jesus presenting a woman of significance, and it's utterly amazing. Some of the earliest Christian art that we have is found in the Roman catacombs. And you can see an image that's almost 2,000 years old, and that's the image of the woman touching the hem of Jesus' garment. People in antiquity were fascinated by the way in which Jesus ministered and cared for women. It was radically unknown in that day. And as Jesus cared for those women and showed 
the impact of the ladies in his life. It was something very, very profound for them. Another story of Jesus in the Gospel of John in the fourth chapter is when Jesus met the woman at the well. And again, an, another ancient image that's revealed in the Roman catacombs. And the fact that Jesus spoke with this woman, that Jesus shared with this woman, that Jesus shared the story of this woman. It was amazing in that era and in that day. Women are featured prominently in the story of the Gospels. Women are featured as leaders in the story of the Gospels. When you look at the message and you look at the story of Jesus, the very last people at the cross were women. The very first people at the tomb were women. The very first evangelist who declared the good news of Jesus, his, his, his resurrection, were women. And we see this image and this role that women played in that story. And we look at it and we see it from the 21st century eyes and we don't think much about it. But in that world, it was radical and it was profound and it was absolutely astounding. I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 37 through, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 37. I'm going to read three verses and I want you to follow along with me. Joanne, if you can help me out here. A woman who lived a sinful life in the city found out that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she took a bottle of perfume and she knelt at his feet. She was crying and she washed his feet with her tears and then she dried his feet with her hair. And she kissed them over and over again and she poured perfume on them. And then the Pharisee who invited Jesus in, into the house, he saw this and he thought, if this man, if he really were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. In this first century world that Jesus is, is speaking and Jesus is engaging, we've got to understand that the invitation to the Pharisee's house, it's not a pleasant invitation. This is a hostile invitation. Jesus isn't going over to have some hamburgers on the grill. Jesus is going to get grilled by a group of religious leaders. Jesus is going into a house where he's not welcomed in the appropriate way. Jesus is going to a house where when people heard he was there, they started arriving. And this woman who lived in the community, who had a very poor reputation, when she heard Jesus was there, she made the way to, G to this house as well because she had to see Jesus. And in fact, the scripture says that as she saw him, she started weeping and crying and her tears anointed his feet and her hair. She used her hair to wipe his feet and she took perfume and she broke the perfume and she's symbolizing her desperate need for repentance and grace and mercy in a very difficult moment. And as she's doing this, there's a religious leader who's watching and he's got a little bit of judgment and he's looking at her and he's saying, man, if Jesus was a real prophet, if Jesus was the real deal, if Jesus was who he says he was, he would understand who this woman was and he would have nothing, nothing to do with her. That's, again, first century world. Let me take you to today's day. Some of you have had the opportunity to travel overseas and maybe some of you have had the opportunity to go to Israel. And if you've ever flown to Israel on a flight that has Hasidic Jews on the flight, these are the individuals who wear the big hats, who wear the long black coats, they will disrupt your flight in a way that's kind of interesting. If you're seated in a seat, a Hasidic man is seated in a seat, and a woman that is not his relative is seated next to him, they will not allow the flight to depart until they move that woman. And they put a man there or a relative of his is there. Literally, they have delayed, delayed flights for hours because they would not allow. And I kind of think, how in the world would they do this? But it happens all the time. There's a community in Jerusalem. It's called Me'a Sharim. It's a Hasidic neighborhood. In that neighborhood, they actually have buses that are designated just for women and just for men. And so men ride their men's buses and the women ride their buses. This is, this is 21st century Jerusalem. If you go to the most sacred holy site in all of Judaism, you go to the Wailing Wall. And if you go to the Wailing Wall, it's an absolutely astounding place. It's my favorite place in all of Jerusalem. You can see the men playing on the, praying on the left-hand side, and there's a dividing wall, and you see the women praying on the right. They won't even let the women and the men mix together in that place. 21st century world. This is our world. That's the philosophy that they have in that capacity. So when this woman... And she's a, living a, lived a very difficult life. When she goes to see Jesus and she's anointing his feet, she's anointing his feet with her tears, with the perfume, wiping his feet with her hair. This is a profound moment. Do you kind of get the picture? The scripture goes on and it says in, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 40, it says, Jesus spoke up and he said, Simon, I got something to say to you. Simon replied, teacher, you're free to speak. 
Two men owned a mold of money lenders some money, and one owned him 500 silver coins, and the other owed him 50. But they couldn't pay it back. He was kind enough, and he canceled their debts. Now, who do you think will love him the most? And then turning to the woman, he said, Simon, you see this woman, don't you? I came into your house, but you didn't wash my feet. But she's washed my feet with her tears, and she's dried them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss. But ever since I came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put any oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. That's why I'm telling you, her many sins have been forgiven. Her great love proves that. But whoever receives little forgiveness, they love very little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And the other guests thought, who is this man that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in, this p- in peace. When you look at this story and you see back in verse 44, Simon was, is being judgmental and Simon is doing this. Jesus says to this man, he says, Simon, you see this woman, don't you? Meaning that up to this point, Simon has not offered her a greeting. Simon has not offered her a drink. Simon has not acknowledged her presence. Simon has not done anything to even identify that this woman is in the house. He's done everything he could to ignore this woman and not even recognize her existence up until this very moment. She's been ignored. She's been, been insulted and on and on and on. And Jesus goes through and he says, look what she's done. She's anointed my feet. She's kissed my head. She's poured her perfume. You... You haven't done anything. You haven't even given me the basic response. You haven't even given me the basic, the basic graces of having a host and having a guest in, this, in your home. And he goes on and you can see as he tells this story that this woman needed grace and she needed hope and she needed redemption. And she's expressed it in the way in which she responded to Jesus. And Jesus ultimately looks at her and he says, woman, your faith has saved you. Go, go in this peace, this story. It's a fascinating picture of Jesus dealing with a broken person, dealing with a person who's messed up, dealing with a person who's made some mistakes, dealing with a person who desperately needed redemption and salvation. And I want you to understand something as we begin this. No matter what her life might have been like, like, Jesus saw significance in her story. Jesus saw that she was a person of significance and worth and value. And Jesus spoke some life and hope and peace into her. When we see the story of ladies in our lives today and we see the stories that are taking place all around us, I'd like to say three things to women in this room and young ladies in this room, but I think it can be applied to everybody. And the facts are these. Society does not determine your worth. Society does not determine your worth. In the first century Jewish world, this woman had very little value. In the first century Roman world, this woman's life had very little value. I picked on the the, uh, the Indians and the Chinese and what they're doing right now with gender selective abortion. In the Roman world, they obviously could not tell if a little girl was being carried by her mama so they didn't know and they could not end the, end the pregnancy in that capacity. But what they did when a little girl was born and mom and dad didn't want a little girl, they'd take the little girl and they would sit her outside the city walls and they'd let nature take its course. That was the Roman way. That was legal until the 5th century. The 5th century, 500 years. And even after it was ruled illegal, it still took place and it still happened. In that society, women's lives just were not that valued. Yet Jesus speaks life and hope and peace. Jesus accepted. Jesus received. Jesus acknowledged that individual. And you kind of think, how in the world does that speak to our story today? We live in the 21st century where life is a little bit different, thankfully. But we live in a day where society still tries to say what our value is. Some of us, some of our younger friends, some of our younger sisters, some of our younger brothers... They place a lot of value on their value in social media. The number of likes that they get on Facebook or Twitter or or Snap or whatever the social platform is. A lot of their value is seen on what people like about them. I'm a big fan of the Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I love Dwayne. I think he's silly. and I like watching his goofy movies. Do you realize in his latest movie he got a $1 million bonus because of the amount of likes he gets on social media? A $1 million payoff because of his social media platform. I thought that was crazy, but it's the truth. 
Society gives us our value based on our beauty and our appearance. When I was in middle school, there was a lady who was a very popular actress at that point. Her name was Kim Basinger. Some of you might remember Kim Basinger. Kim Basinger, I don't remember what magazine this happened, but her face was featured, let's say it was Time or Newsweek. I don't remember which one. And it said something to the, to the, to the degree, the face that is worth a million dollars. And the next week, the competing magazine put a little article in there and said, no, it's not. That face cost 12,000 bucks. And it talked about all the airbrushing they had to do and it cost $12,000 to put her face on that magazine. And it was kind of fascinating to me reading that as a young man of where our beauty is viewed because when you were looking at her face on Time or Newsweek or whatever it was, it wasn't her real face. Now that's back when I was a kid. Some of us today, we might be familiar with the name Kardashian. We might be familiar with Kim or Chloe or whoever they are. I don't know who all they are. And we, we, see, we see this family that have become celebrities just because they put themselves out on social media and they put themselves out everywhere. I read an article this week. Kim Kardashian has a team of makeup artists who spend over two hours a day putting her face together. Two hours a day. They spend almost $3,000 a day. She spends almost $3,000 a day with the makeup per day. Guys, if I had somebody working on my face for two hours and putting $3,000 on my face, I would be as good looking as John Dunn. I mean, I, could, I would be even handsome. But uh, amen, I got an amen right there. Seriously, society says this is what beauty is. Society says this is what we need to look like. Society says this is how much you need to weigh. This is how old you need to be. This is the status that you need to have. And we look at all this stuff and it's affecting our daughters. It's affecting our granddaughters. And society is not the one who needs to determine your worth. Jesus says that he loves you just the way you are. And Jesus shows us over and over and over again that you are valuable and that you are precious to him. Society cannot determine our worth. And that's a constant battle that moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters have to fight as we work through this process. The first century world said one thing about young ladies. And our 21st century world says something totally different. And this is still a battle. Second thing I want you to take away beyond society doesn't determine your worth is that you, me, we were created for a purpose. The story of this woman in Luke chapter 7, her past was a hard past. It was a difficult past. There was a brokenness and there was mess. There was junk. But her story of hope and redemption and restoration, for the last 2,000 years, we've been telling the story of what it looks like, and we've pointed to her as an example of hope and grace. And that woman is a hero for us. You were created for a purpose. She was created for a purpose. In the New Testament story, we see some ladies who did some incredible things. We see a lady by the name of Phoebe, who was a deaconess. We see a woman named Junius, who was among the apostles. We see a woman named Priscilla, who probably was the pastor of a house church and who was very influential in the life of Apollos. We see over and over again women that God used in substantial ways in the early church. There's an incredible historical document that we have by two Roman leaders, a guy by the name of Pliny is writing, excuse me, a guy by the name of Trajan is writing his uncle Pliny. Pliny's an executive in the Roman leadership. Pliny is advising his younger nephew about some challenges that he's facing. Trajan has just captured a number of churches in modern-day Turkey, and he's found that there are some women in the church who are leaders in the church, but they're also slaves in the church. And he's asking his uncle, he said, Listen, these slaves that are deaconesses, can I kill them? Or because they're slaves, they were forced to do this. And his uncle wrote back, and he said, These churches, these Christians are different. Women have places of leadership. A deacon is a leader. Kill them. Kill them. That first century church valued women in places of leadership. They did. And it's a place that we need to recognize. Some of us in recent days, we've been impressed by the exploits of this woman. Her name is Tammy Jo Schultz. She's a pilot. She was one of the very first F-18 fighter pilots in the U.S. Navy. She flies now for Southwest Airlines. A couple of weeks ago, a jet engine on the flight that she was on the plane that she was flying blew up, and she was able to safely land that airplane. She's a hero. 
She's an incredible person, an incredible leader. Some of us might know the woman on the crutches. She's a sitting U.S. senator from Illinois. Her name is Tammy Duckworth. She followed in her father's footsteps and joined the United States Army. And in the U.S. Army in 2004, she was piloting a U.S. Blackhawk in Iraq when her helicopter was hit by a RPG. Her helicopter crashed and she became the first double amputee in the U.S., female W amputee in, in the U.S. Army. She left her career in the military and became a congressional representative in the state of Illinois. Now she's a sitting U.S. senator. She just had her second child, and that U.S. Senate had to change some rules to allow her to bring her baby on the Senate floor. I don't know what God's purpose is for you, but these two ladies show it could be pretty substantial and doing all kinds of crazy things. It might be to be a teacher. It might be to be a nurse. It might be to be a programmer. It might be to stay at home mom. I don't know what your purpose is. But I know God has a purpose for others, There's a, for us in whatever they might be. One of my, and Veronica's very dear friends, she is an executive in a Fortune 100 company, not a Fortune 500, a Fortune 100 company. She and her husband were not able to have children. And in their story, they have chosen to, uh, they've chosen to invest in young adults. And she's investing in kids who are graduating from Ivy League schools that have some other challenges in life. She's investing in, she and her husband are investing in young couples in their church that are, that are learning the ropes of marriage. She and her husband have been very generous to congregations. They've made their choices to make an investment and to pour their hearts and their lives into a host of different areas. I think, I believe that you were called for a purpose. What is your purpose? What is it that God wants you to do? I wish I could tell you, but that's for you and God. And the final piece that I think is important for us to hold on to is this, is that God does not expect perfection from you as a mom, you as a sister, you as a dad, you as a brother, you as a husband. But I do think God wants us to understand that his grace is sufficient. Jesus responded to this woman with mercy and with tenderness, and he responded to her brokenness with a, vo a word of hope and a word of peace. So many times we struggle with this idea that we have to be perfect. We're running very busy lives, very occupied lives, and we're running this direction and that direction. Brene Brown tells a great story. Brene Brown is a professional uh, writer. She's also a counselor. She tells the story that when she gets her kids ready for school, it's very important to her to make sure that they're, they're up on time, that they're dressed appropriately, that they've had a very good breakfast, that she's got a, a well a nutritious lunch is they've got their homework and they go out relatively clean and she says when she drops her kids off she feels pretty good about herself and that's that her husband when it's his turn to take care of the kids on that day he just wants to make sure they've had a pop tart they got a lunchable that they've got clothes on and it doesn't even matter if they brush their teeth or they've combed their hair because that's just the way a dad does it and when dad drops the kids off what do all the moms say oh he's such a good dad he's such a good dad isn't he the best and she says why is it that I feel guilty when I've not done everything, everything, everything. Maybe part of the story is we need to understand that God doesn't expect perfection, but his grace is sufficient. If you have your Bibles, look over in the Gospel of Matthew. Most of us, when we're taking our January commitment to read through the Scripture, whenever we come to the genealogy stories, we skip it because it's boring and we don't know the names. But when we look at the story of Jesus and we look at his genealogy in, in chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 3, this is what the Bible says. Judah was, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Minadab, and Minadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. When you look at the story of Jesus, you're introduced to Tamar, who made some really bad choices, and she is the original Me Too person. You're introduced to a woman named Rahab, who was a prostitute. You're introduced to a woman named Ruth, who was not even Jewish, and her husband probably shouldn't have married her according to the law. And then you're introduced 
to Uriah's wife, who's not even mentioned. Her name is Bathsheba. And she had an affair with King David, and King David had Uriah put to death. When you look at the genealogy of Jesus, I want you to see something. One author said it this way. He said, God chose these four women to be in the genealogical line of Jesus, the Savior of the world. They are proof that God weaves even our mistakes and our disappointments, our hurts and our sin into his plan. I want you to think right now about the biggest mistake in your life. I want you to think right now about the biggest disappointment in your life. I want you to think of the sins that you are most ashamed of. I want you to think of the biggest hurt in your life. Then, understand this. Even before you were born, God knew those things were going to happen in your life. And he developed a plan that would bring good out of them. What a God. This is the kind of God we worship. As followers of Jesus, we don't deny our mistakes. We don't hide them in a closet. We don't pretend we never screwed up. We don't pretend other people don't hurt us. We're open about our feelings, our faults, and our failures, and our frustrations, and our fears. We are trophies of his grace. That's the story that we see, and that's the story that we find. Guys, we live in extraordinary, busy lives where our lives are constantly in motion, where we're constantly going to this place and that place and the other place. And my challenge as we wrap this up is this. In the busyness of the world in which you live, find time, find a place to center in, to center in on that cross and see your hope and see your peace and find your redemption and your, redemp and your restoration because you are worth it. Jesus believes that. You're worth it. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we focus in on your word today, as we celebrate your grace and your mercy on Mother's Day, we are reminded of your great love for those of us who are broken and busted. We're reminded of your great affection for those of us who have fallen so far short of the glory of God. We are reminded, God, of your grace that meets us in the darkest days of our lives. And we are thankful that you don't give up on us, that you hold us and you embrace us and you want to show us another way. Father, walk with us. Help us to walk in the light of your life and help us to walk in the fullness of your love. Help us to be filled with your spirit that we might show the light of Christ in the world around us. Thank you for your love and your mercy. It's in Jesus' name we pray.